Hey everyone. All right. Hello everyone. My name is Lily Mora. I'm a professional learning manager at Computer Science Teachers Association. You are here today because you signed up uh, to learn more about Asian American Pacific Islander Heritage Month. And we're so glad you did because today the topic of our webinar is Let Them Be Heard, an AAPI panel and Heritage Month resources event. So we're so glad you're here. This is a part of a professional learning series that's hosted by CSTA. Um, today is um, Wednesday, April 27, 2022, um, and we are at 6 p.m. Central Time. So in the chat, we would love for you to introduce yourself, your location, and what AAPI Heritage Month means to you. So we'll take that time to, we'll give you all a minute to start sharing your name, your location, and um, what does AAPI Heritage Month mean to you? So while folks are entering that in the chat, I, I, my name is Lily Moore, as I mentioned. I'm from Vallejo, California. And um, this, the month of May, um, which is the AAPI Heritage Month, is a time for me to explore my multi-ethnic heritage and to celebrate the contributions of the AAPI community. Lynn, would you like to introduce yourself while folks are? Yeah, do a quick absolutely. Intro, just with a quick, in, quick uh, response to the, the prompt. Yes, absolutely. So um, my name is Lynn Diaz. I'm a director at the Constellation Center for Equity and Computing at Georgia Tech. And um, what AAPI Heritage Month means for me is um, the uh, convening of um, colleagues and peers um, to acknowledge and celebrate um, contributions and, um, and our culture um, during this month. Thanks, Lynn. Um, we have Owen in the chat that said that um, Owen is working to be an ally and accomplice. Elizabeth mentioned sol solidarity and Edge says um, that Edge is here to listen and learn about the experience of experiences of the diaspora and hear experiences and let them be heard. Um, so, um, and so we wanna thank you, keep that coming. We wanna thank you all for sharing and for being here today. Um, it's, we have such the great pleasure of having this panel being moderated um, by someone who I admire so much. This is Lynn Diaz. She's the founding director of the Constellation Center for Equity and Computing at Georgia Tech. Um, she brings an essential core foundation of equity and access and opportunity to CS education. And her role as a director of educational innovation and leadership really helps establish the Constellation Center as a leader in expanding CS education through an equitable and comprehensive approach in national, international, state, and local education systems. So without further ado, I'd love to welcome Lynn Diz. Thank you very much, Lily. Thank you so much. Um, I'm really excited to be here to be talking about AAPI Heritage Month. And um, I'll start out by, you know, just saying a little more about myself. Um, I'm an immigrant. Um, I'm a child of immigrant parents. My mother and I were uh, both born in Vietnam. My father was born in Mexico. And he was a soldier in the US Army and served during the Vietnam War, where he met my mother. And, um, and you know, we were lucky, um, my mother and, and I, we were uh, airlifted out of Vietnam a year later uh, in the aftermath of that war, um, it leaving behind, uh, you know, an entire family, grandparents, aunts, uncles, cousins, um, it took, 20 years to be reunited with them, but thankfully, um, you know, they're in the United States now. I'm also a first-gen college student, I'm the only sibling in my family that was able to do that, just sort of given my family circumstances, um, that's just how it turned out. So, you know, it's just been very fortunate. But I am just so honored to be having this conversation tonight about AAPI Heritage Month. Um, and like I said earlier, you know, as an acknowledgement, but also as a celebration of the contributions that the Asian American 
Native Hawaiian and Pacific Islander community has afforded our nation. I mean, all the way from like beginning of the first transcontinental railroad in the late 1880s, right? Um, to shaping fair labor laws. The AAPI community helped to do that um, in collaboration with the United Farm Workers. There's a whole history on that. Um, and even having the first uh, Asian American woman, you know, a, a woman of color, first woman of color as an Asian American woman to be elected to Congress in 1964. And that was uh, Patsy Mink. Um, from Hawaii. And, and even though, you know, I mean, and the AAPI community, you know, we're less than 6% of the nation's population. Um, but the new American economy data shows that it is currently the fastest growing minority group in the United States. So, you know, this panel, uh, this panel conversation that we're about to have tonight is going to focus on the experiences of some amazing AAPI educators in our community. So I want to go ahead and get started and introduce them. Um, uh, yeah, all right. So tonight, I'll just go in the order that they're shown here. We have Lily Tula, who is an assistant principal and district lead, a CS lead in uh, Queens, New York. Um, did I get that right, Lily? Is it? Yes, awesome. And then we have Sandra Hartman who is the computer technology and digital media educator in Lehman Township, Pennsylvania. And then we have Elizabeth Name, a data analytics coach in Los Angeles on the West Coast. I am super excited <laughs> to have you all here tonight. So welcome, welcome to this conversation. Uh, so I first wanted to ask each of you uh, this, this first question to first uh, self-identify, you know, tell us how you self-identify, and then talk a little bit about your perspectives on the diversity within the AAPI community. I mean, just within this group, you know, <laughs> um, there's diversity. And sometimes these nuances get lost, you know, when we say Asian or Asian American. And so, I'd like to hear from you about how you address the variety within, you know, the the AAPI communities um, in in our in our nation. So we can start out in the order that we did introductions. Lily, if you'd like to kick us off, then we'll um, hear from Sandra and then Elizabeth. Sure. Um, uh, for me, I self-identify as I'm Chinese American. I am. Um, first generation born to immigrants who came to this country. Uh, so for me, um, being very connected to my Chinese heritage is um, extremely important. It's a way of connecting with my, my, my mother um, and my grandmother because um, growing up, they didn't necessarily speak English so well. So for me, the language and the food of, of my culture is something that really helps to bond us as a family. And it's something that I feel like, you know, as an adult now, I, um, I return to that more and more um, just to have that connection not with my mom. You know, really, that's like a very big thing. So for me, I do strongly identify as Chinese American. Um, and I do think that the term Asian, it sort of flattens um, the, the richness and the diversity in, in our communities. Right, because it's it's such a broad term, and I think it's it's a very convenient term instead of maybe having people do the work to understand the nuances within our community. Um, and I and I think that's something that you know we need to do a better job of highlighting um, and bringing awareness to, and just having people start understanding the, the vast differences that that term can encompass. And I think that is honestly, that that's gonna take time and awareness building. Um, I think because for too long, that was a very convenient and easy phrase to kind of lean on, um, but here we are, you know, and, and yeah. we know better, we can do better. Yeah, thank you, Lily. Sandra, you wanna go next? 
Sure. So um, I am a Korean American. Um, that's how I self identify. Um, I was actually born in Korea. Um, my dad was an uh, American uh, GI, uh, was uh, sent to Korea, uh, stationed in Korea, met my mom. And so then I was born there. And then the, I came when I was nine months old. So um, first generation, I guess, because I'm not, you know, my brother and my sister were both born here. So I would consider them more first generation than me since I wasn't born in Korea. But um, I was the first one to, to go to college. Um, and um, so very similar it, stories to, 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 uh, to both Lily and Leon. Um, I think that for me, um, when you were talking really about food, like, and, and language, my mom, when she first came here, I was nine months old. She barely spoke English when she met my dad. And um, so she was always so busy learning English that she, you know, that was, she was around people that only spoke English and she never taught us Korean. It's my, it's my one regret is that I'm not fluent in Korean. I understand a lot more than I can speak. Um, but, uh, but then also when you were talking about food, um, my mom still cooks Korean food. Like I ate Korean food tonight. Um, and it's like my comfort. It really is. I, I agree with you. Like whenever I, you know, I'm feeling it, uh, I, I can't watch a Korean drama and not want to have ramen noodles, like immediately either during or after. So, um, I'm totally there with you on that. Um, it's so interesting that you, that we talked about language, um, because I think that that in our community is, is really um, something that I struggle with. And I think a lot of other people struggle with this whole idea of, um, you know, are you, uh, what, what are you, what are you, how, how many times have we heard that? Um, or uh, don't speak English, speak English. Like when my mom and my, my aunt are together, her sister, they will speak Korean to each other sometimes. And when we're in public, I can see it. I can see it sometimes, the looks. And, and, and when I was younger, I would be embarrassed and I would say, speak English, speak English, because they both speak English. But when they were together, you know, they would go back to their, their native tongue. Um, and so I think that uh, as far as losing some of those, those traditions, you know, I losing the language. They say that the food is always the last thing to go culturally, though. And, and I really do believe that. Yeah, thank you, Sandra. I just posted, uh, you know, something about language. I do believe it is so much a part of how, uh, you know, the AAPI community uh, identifies um, in relation to language. Um, all right, so we want to hear from Elizabeth, too. Hi, everyone. Hi, Lynn. Hello. Lynn. Um, so I self-identify as uh, Southwest Asian. And I know for some people that might sound surprising um, because I'm Lebanese. So my family, um, you know, is Arab and Southwest Asian is sort of a term that has been sort of re um, kind of taken back in a way. Um, if you've heard of Middle Eastern, have you ever stopped to consider from whose perspective? Is, um, is this the Middle East versus the Far East? Um, so I never really liked that term, but I think that as a Lebanese woman, as a Southwest Asian woman, that there is so much that is lost when we apply these broad terms. Um, and it's so interesting because I, uh, as, as an Arab woman, I also, feel that erasure very, very clearly when I'm checking boxes on the US census. Um, so if you've noticed, it's white, including Middle Eastern people, which I don't know how that made sense in someone's mind, but there is this element of erasure. Um, and so I think it's so important when we're talking about our identity um, and we are looking societally at Demo, like demographic information and who's in power, like 
where we're breaking it down and how we're disaggregating data so that people are not invisible behind the numbers. Um, and I think that's a that's just a like Lily said, it's just going to take time and awareness also. Um, but I mentioned that solidarity is what I think of when I when I think of this month because of we have so much in common, right? <laughs> we have a lot in common. Um, and yes, I'm also the child of immigrant parents. Um, I have a lot have benefited from layers and layers of privilege, even so um, being like white passing and being kind of racially ambiguous. So um, there's there's a lot to unpack within that identity. Yeah, well, um, we appreciate you sharing that. And I, um, I think this part of the conversation is really important to just, um, you know, like Sandra and Lily said, to raise more awareness about the, you know, the diversity within, when we say AAPI, there's a lot more to it, you know, um, than just the letters that are in AAPI. Um, and so thank you for sharing your uh, story, Elizabeth. I'm gonna move us into a little bit more about your role in this computer science education space and wanted to, ask, uh, you know, talk a little bit more about what you do and how you think CS education can play a role in changing the narrative for our communities. Um, you know, so talk a little bit more about your role and, and uh, you know, what you do in your role to, to uh, increase awareness about the narratives about the AAPI community. Uh, Sandra, I think we're gonna start with you on this one. No pressure there. Um, I think that as um, as females, um, or myself as female, um, I think that Asian American women, especially in CS, is such a small percentage, and um, I think that there's a misconception that all Asians are really, really good at math and are in all of these tech careers and these science careers, but really it's, it's more men than women. And so I try to um, talk to my students and share with them a lot of those statistics because I, th they, I think they come with these preconceived stereotypes, these preconceived notions of what it looks like what CS looks like. And, and I try to push back and give them an opportunity to think about me as a role model, as, as a symbol of, of what it could be to be in CS and not be, you know, I, I, to quote the Big Bang, the Sheldon Coopers of the world, you know? And um, it, it's, it, I think that um, we, can talk a lot to our students um, about identity and who they are and who we are and open that dialogue with your students. And when you do that, then um, it, it gives them a freedom to feel like they can talk about their own um, backgrounds and their own identities and then use that information to, to open up that dialogue about, well, why don't you think that you have a place in CS? And, and let's talk about why. Yeah, thank you, Sandra. Um, Elizabeth, you wanna uh, add to that? Yeah, so my work in CS started really accidentally um, when a assistant principal just asked me a month before I started my first teaching role, if wouldn't I like to teach AP computer science? Um, and as a new teacher, I, I had no idea what I was doing. I just plunged right into Coursera and edX and found this field to be just so inviting and so creative and so fun um, that I, I think that it's a rare opportunity in our curriculum to really be um, just inclusive of everybody. Um, and I, I think that when we when we look at CS, we often think um, the stereotype is that it, it's 
programming and it's math and it's hard code and that there's no room for deviation, but actually it's an opportunity for creative expression. Um, and I think that we have such brilliant tools now that we can draw on as educators um, that make programming, you know, visual and artistic through some of like Scratch and Snap and all of these awesome curricula that we can that we can draw on. Um, but my basically I um, started to push for computer science everywhere that I went. So I, I went to a new school that wasn't a computer science department. All of my students were taking math, uh, were taking pre-calculus and calculus. And as you can imagine, not everybody feels very welcome in, in those spaces either. Um, so it, it, it's like just such a pleasure to teach to teach CS. And now I'm so I'm no longer a, a high school teacher. Now I'm a data science coach at an ed tech company where we um, we're basically building an alternative to college education to open alternative pathways into high paying tech careers for people from underrepresented backgrounds. Um, and so their apprentices, they get paid while they're learning on the job. And I think it's a, a beautiful um model that really challenges how we this like linear approach that leaves so many um, on the side and so my apprentices I have are, are so diverse but many of them are struggling with feeling included in their workspaces right now um, so they're at like google and at these tech companies and it's like I'm I can teach the concepts but also we have to be cognizant of, you know, what, what that pipeline looks like and where along the pipeline from, from middle school, right? Where, where there's a huge drop off in um, girls participation oh, yeah. in computer science to um, those first year college courses where there's an intentional weeding out of um, people, of, of all sorts of, of folks who just to kind of narrow down who, who can get into engineering and NCS and then in the and then in the corporate space. So um, I think that we really need to elevate and identify those champions of CS within the Asian community so that there is a, there is a community to be part of. Um, so highlighting employee resource groups or or um, I know CSTA does amazing work with um, highlighting champions of CS from all backgrounds. I think that's just really worth the investment and um, encourage all teachers to kind of check that out. Yeah, Elizabeth, you bring up um, so many good points and I have a follow-up question um, that I'll ask after this, um, after this round, okay? <laughs> and, um, and then I'll ask you to chime in on that. It has, uh, it's related to, um, you know, your comments about um, the, um, the inclusivity or the inclusion and sense of belonging for Asian students. Um, I'll ask that in the next round. But we also want to hear from Lily um, about your perspectives, and, you know, your role and your perspectives on uh, changing the narrative for the AAPI community in CS. I was I was saying in the chat that Sandra like must have like trolled my brain and just took everything out of there. Um, it's it's very interesting because I became a CS teacher after um, someone had retired, and he was an older gentleman. He was Caucasian, and so actually with within the first like month, a lot of the kids were, were kind of like, are you sure like this is like something like you can do? And I was like really surprised, but then I started to figure out they had never seen somebody who looked like me in a role in this content area. And so then it dawned on me, I was like, they're not just, they're just, it's sort of symptomatic of the fact that they just haven't, you can't be it until you see it. Um, and so when Sandra said that, I was like a hundred percent, um, that was something I thought was very interesting. I also had, you know, young girls who said to me, they're like, you know, I never thought like, that's something that I could do, but I really like this. And I feel like maybe I want to do it in middle school and in high school and see what I want to do. And so I, I'm in a three K to five, uh, setting. So I've got like super teeny tinies. 
Um, and for me, I am really passionate about exposing um, young children to computer science because I feel that it sort of creates this culture where they feel that they do have a seat at the table, that they come to middle school with almost like prerequisite skills that, you know, building on what Elizabeth said, is, is not going to actually preclude them from the pipeline. In fact, you know, if you cultivate like this K-5 sort of curriculum in computer science, you're really giving children this best shot at entering this field if they so chose, right? It's, it's this idea of like having, you know, upward mobility, like options, right? And for me, I think that's been really powerful to see um, happening uh, in, in my school building, in my district, um, in, in my, you know, the Department of Education's very, very much proponents of CS for All. And this is something that I feel that the more teachers of color that we have, the more that we're going to empower and give our children agency to believe and to do these things that maybe they thought were never for them. So, you know, for both Elizabeth and, and Sandra, you guys, what you guys said, like really resonated with my experience too, in this field. Um, I think it's just, half of it is just being the person in the room to show them that you can do it. And then being able to create the culture, the environment and the structures that will give our children this power to do that work. So that's, that's me. <laughs> yeah, no, that's great. That's great for, um... For sharing that, I I do think I I think everyone or a lot of people believe that the sooner kids get exposed to it, you know, the more we can do to create their identity um, and sense of belonging in the discipline. And and uh, you know, Elizabeth said something about we lose a lot of students in the middle school in the upper grade levels. Uh, it's so unfortunate, but we do. And I think it's because there's um there's so there's a lot more like restrictions you know um less choice and they have to follow a certain path and you know sometimes they don't find that path so um my follow-up question to this which i think yeah, is um is i'd really like to hear from you um in terms of what is known as the model minority myth within the aapi community and um, you know, sort of the stereotyping of uh, Asian, Asian Americans. Um, and that is that that community is usually not included in CS equity initiatives because even though we're a small uh, percentage of the population and, you know, as a whole in the United States, um, the data show that there's an over over representation of you know, Asian students, even though it's a small number, it's an overrepresentation, And so they're usually not the target population for CS equity initiatives. So um, I'd like to hear about your, uh, you know, perspectives on how this affects the advancement of the AAPI community in tech fields, um, you know, and, and what we can do better to lift up uh, the AAPI community in STEM fields. And Elizabeth, I'd like to start with you on this one. Yeah, I all there is something lost in all stereotypes, right? And when we like by many markers, Asian Americans as a whole are super successful you know, on, on these particular markers. But when you look and break it down, there are so many subgroups that go unseen and unheard um, based on those aggregated statistics. I'm thinking like Philippine, my Filipino friends um, talk about this all the time. Vietnamese, like there are Hmong, there's so many subgroups that don't have a voice with when you talk about the model minority myth. Um, and more so it's, it's damaging even to, to, to everybody within it anyway. It's because like you said, when there's this perception that you are already set up for success, that it is inherent in your DNA, then you aren't sought after for mentorship opportunities or, or leadership development. And I think that is a huge problem within the tech space um, 
there are several studies that have shown that Asian American uh, white collar professionals are the least likely to be promoted into management and into upper level uh, positions once they're hired. So I think it's like, okay, so there's either a lack of leadership potential there, or they're not being identified and developed. And I think this model minority myth has a lot to do with, with that. Um, so what we need to do is build relationships with our, in my case, apprentices uh, or students um, as individuals and get they like, spend the time to know who they are and what their aspirations are what their what what are their um what are their beliefs about what they can do what are their limiting beliefs about what they can't do and just really act as a as a coach and a, a soundboard um because we we talk a lot about like imposter syndrome and i take such issue with this now i've discovered recently that it was um a term coined by two white women in the, who, to describe their experience in the corporate space and has been kind of broadly applied to all minoritized groups. And I, I find myself also even in my work with students and with apprentices talking about, you know, how to affirm their identities and different um, tools that they can use to, to um, build themselves up. But at the same time, the onus when we talk about imposter syndrome is then on the individual and loses sight of, well, maybe maybe um, I shouldn't be contorting myself to fit into a system that wasn't made for me. Um, so I think it's important to, to just be cognizant of, of the, the potential that is in everyone and seek it out and not make assumptions about people's capacity um, because we don't know unless we, we, we um, investigate and lean into it. Yeah, yeah, I, I totally agree with that. Um, and just having, you know, worked on lots of, you know, sort of grants, um, both uh, publicly funded, federally funded and things of that nature, there's always, always a push, you know, that I have to, <laughs> kind of navigate uh, on the inclusion of the AAPI students and teachers, um, you know, to, to be able to participate in those CS equity efforts. Um, uh, Lily or Sandra, would any of you want to add um, your perspectives on this? I think Elizabeth said it really, really well. Um, she even, you know, the, the biggest thing that I was also, I, I also like will confirm with her is that, you know, I, I do worry that for our children is that the stereotype will allow them to have entry into maybe like tech jobs and tech industries. But once you get to like upper management and leadership roles, right, the statistics and they're out there um, they drop significantly. And it's also very much in particular for Asian women. Um, so I think that these are things that maybe aren't as highlighted because of the stereotype. Yeah. Um, it makes it easy to say, oh yeah, they're really great, very people who are very well educated and, and privileged and, and very much you know competitive in the industry. But the reality is also like, um, within the AAPI community, we have the most vast socioeconomic disparities. And, right. you know, if you really look at the data, um, AAPIs, you know, occupy many different industries. It's not just tech. And um, this myth of like privilege that comes with the model minority stereotype is also not true once you actually break down the data. So, I think because of that, you know, I, I feel concerns for, for our children that are going into the workforce that are very hireable immediately, you know, but then they reach that point in their career where they start to question, you know, why, what's happening, right? And I, I love how Elizabeth said, it's, you know, they need coaches, they need groups, they need, you know, more than just, you know, unfortunately merit alone. It, it's, it's more than that. It's beyond that. Right. So in that very much so, I agree that sometimes that stereotype, 
not sometimes, but that stereotype is very hurtful sometimes in the in the career path that we choose to take. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for that. All right. So um, I want to move us into uh, an important part of this conversation um, about hate crimes against uh the AAPI community. And, you know, we know this is not new. You've talked a lot about, um, you know, ex just your experiences, but there's been a significant increase in these crimes over the last couple of years of, you know, the COVID-19 pandemic. Just this past February, um, you know, there was data like all over the news that showed that anti-Asian hate crimes increased by 339% last year compared to the year before. I mean, that's just a lot, especially in, in places like New York, uh, San Francisco, you know, even Los Angeles. Um, and, uh, you know, even I was not immune to racial slurs or comments about this, you know, China virus. So I, I wanted to ask, you and this is you know this is a voluntary question um it's a two-part question one is you know your thoughts about how we can prevent these types of hate crimes even if it's just in our circles uh, you know at work or our, our circle you know in our families and friends what do we do what what can we do to prevent these um hate crimes and and be able to have these important conversations um within our circles and um the, the second part is if you're willing to, um, could you share any insights or your experiences on discrimination and bigotry that has impacted you and your professional trajectory and how, how you were able to address that? I'll go ahead and, and go. Um, I think that um, ultimately it's all about education and 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 a lot of the hate crimes that are happening are coming from people are coming from a, 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 a an ignorance ignorance to who we are as as a culture as a as 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 a people and and until we you know until people start to get more educated on the fact that you know that it is covid isn't China's fault, you know, um, and those kinds of things that we hear, um, then, you know, it's, it's that kind of stuff. I think that until we can find a way to remove those barriers of, of ignorance um, to who we are and, and how, how we live our lives so similar to so many people. Um, I think that for me personally, I have been in some ways um, lucky because a lot of people don't see me as Asian. A lot of people when they first meet me will think that I am Hispanic or part, part African-American. And because they don't know that Koreans can have dark skin and it's, it's very frustrating. Um, but because of that, I don't see a lot of the Asian um, stuff, I see a lot of, of the African-American um, stuff. I've had racial slurs given to me by, by students that were not Asian slurs, they were African-American slurs. And I, I remember the one situation where a student had written something horrific on, my, on a desk about me and the principal didn't want to show me. And I was like, just show me. And then I started laughing and he's like, why are you laughing? I'm like, if he's going to make racial slurs, at least he could get them right. Like, it's just, it's so frustrating sometimes. Um, and uh, I also think that the idea of, of, of language, going back to language, is that sometimes when people hear someone speaking in, in, in broken English that they automatically have this preconceived notion of who they are. And it's, that's also very frustrating. I think that, that, you know, they see that and they hear that and then they, they, because they don't have that um, education or experience, they just immediately go to this other extreme 
just because they hear the language that's different. Yeah, I, you know, we've all seen even in memes or in movies too, how the, you know, lots of Asian languages are mimicked, but in a, you know, uh, in a sometimes, you know, funny, but not respectful way. Yeah, okay, we see that all the time and we've seen kids do that as well too. And I think, I think you're right. A lot of it is, um, you know, being more knowledgeable, um, uh, you know, uh, being educated about different uh, cultures is super important too. I want to extend an invitation to either Lily or Elizabeth um, to share uh, your perspectives, or we can, um, you know, it's up to you. I I can't say that anything that's unique that Sandra hasn't said because she is clearly so eloquent. Um, she, she, no, she really nails it. I think a lot of it is awareness and, and debunking a lot of things that maybe come out of ignorance or a lack of exposure to, um, people from other walks of life. Um, that's a big thing. Um, I would say that in, in professionally, I feel lucky that I work in an extremely diverse school system. So that's, a little bit different than other people's experiences. I have um, children that represent different countries all across the globe and different cultures and ethnicities. Um, and so for me, I, I feel like maybe that has happened less to me in, in my profession here, but that's also very unique. The DOE is incredibly diverse. That's not every school district. This is 100% a unique school district. And I'm very lucky to, to be able to work in that. Uh, sort of environment. Um, but I will say that I think there are very intentional efforts um, within my district, within my school building, from myself to affirm other students' identities. From the get-go, from this early on, um, we are very intentional about the literature that we read to our children, um, the type of representation that gets hung around walls, Right, the type of music that we play, that we welcome from all different cultures. Um, and also just even like food. Sometimes I'll take a stroll down to the cafeteria and I'll just say, wow, that looks so amazing. I'm like, can you tell me more about that? And where can I try it, right? And just hearing that affirmed from an adult, celebrating other children's cultures, foods, languages. So I can, get by on working Spanish and I can speak Mandarin and Cantonese and English clearly. Um, and I'll move fluidly between that with my newcomers, right? With my, with my immigrant parents, right? Or and with my um, MLLs and my Ls, right? My multilingual learners and my English language learners. And it affirms for them that it's okay for them to trans language in school, right? And that starts to unravel a lot of this mystery and ignorance sometimes, right, around things and just building that culture in your classroom, in your building. And, and it, takes, it takes a village. I'm not saying it doesn't, but if you all have the same intent, right, it can happen. And, and it is a very beautiful thing when children come to school knowing they're affirmed in who they are and they're celebrated, right? And that's, to me, probably the, the biggest way to advocate and, and to push back against these things is, is doing what you can within your sphere, right? And, and getting as many people on board to move that work. Yeah, I, that's well said. I do believe in that. Um, that's why I had mentioned, you know, the importance of having these conversations even within our, just our small circles, you know, whether it's at work or families, or, you know, or friends that um, that that, uh, that is a really great way to you know start having those conversations. Elizabeth? Yeah, I mean, so eloquent, both of you. Um, I would just add that coming back to what you asked about earlier, Lynn, the model minority myth and the effects of that, like I'm, I'm remembering now last year, um, there being a, a few racial 
incidents that happened on my campus where Asian students, the two or three, by the way, at our school, um, felt very unsafe. And it, it comes back to the damaging effect that these narratives can have um, because it drives communities that really ought to be working together um, to dismantle systems of oppression that are working against all of us. Um, as an Arab woman, my, you know, as a Latino, as a black person, as, a, as, as any, any person of color, we are battling this, this these same um, systems and cycles. And I think just, it, it's, it's really important that we, when we're talking about equity and that when we're talking about justice, that we think about all of the colors within it. Um, and, and we draw those, we, we bring out the stories and we draw parallels between histories. One of my very good educator friends is a huge, he, he's a, a black teacher in Los Angeles and he is a huge advocate for black liberation, but also Palestinian liberation. And I think that that is another example of, of, a, of a, parallel, a historical parallel that we don't often identify or elevate, but it's so powerful when you're able to have cross-cultural dialogue and learn from each other. And that takes a willingness, vulnerability, and bravery as well. Um, so yeah. I, we need so much more of that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And I think it was, um, you know, what one of you had mentioned that it's, um, it's going to take time. And I think, you know, understanding that it's going to take time is really important. But we all have, you know, that one family member or that one friend that's like, no, man, this has to happen now, <laughs> you know, and, um, and I wish we could do that, too. I, I really wish we could make that change overnight. But it's, I think, conversations like this and the conversations and the work that you all are doing, you know, that's, that's going to um, uh, have, a, have a greater impact, you know, because you're doing it well. We have to do it, you know, it doesn't happen overnight. It's, it's, it can be a little quicker, but it has to, it has to, be, it has to be done well. You know? Yeah. So I want to... Um, I, I want to wrap this up with uh, a, a question that I think um, you know might be fun to hear from all of you, and that is, uh, I wanted to ask you what are some of your favorite like family or cultural traditions that are especially important to you, um, and if you'd like to add, you know, you know who inspires you um, into that, that would be great because we want to hear from you on that. And then we also want to share some resources for uh, the community, uh, you know, um, to be able to access. But uh, I'm going to go back to um, the beginning. Lily, we're going to start with you um, sharing, you know, your one of your favorite maybe family traditions and, um, and, uh, and who inspires you. Um, <clears throat> if we're talking about who inspires me that is an AAPI, it would be my mom. Uh, she came here when she was 25. She spoke no English. She raised a family here. She put herself through school, mm -hmm. night school to learn English. Um, and she's, she's, to me, she's amazing because I can't imagine transplanting my, some, myself somewhere where I knew nothing. And I just came with the clothes on my back off a plane. Um, so just speaking to the resilience and the beauty of, of AAPIs who've made that journey and, and come to America to eke out a new life um, and really working from the ground up, like my mom truly inspires me um, in honor of AAPI Heritage Month, 100%. Um, in terms of favorite family or cultural traditions, um, oh man, you guys are going to think I'm like obsessed with food, but like, I just like love food with like my family, like during Chinese New Year's, we'll make dumplings together. Um, we will make um, tong yuan, which is like those little um, like rice flour um, that have stuff that's like stuffed inside with like black sesame. Um, 
for other holidays, literally every holiday is food centric <laughs> for my family. This is not new for most families, but we end up usually sitting around a big table. I have three younger siblings and we sit together and we usually make the food and it's, yes. it's not even the eating the food part. It's just the process of gathering and, and making that food that connects to like hundreds of years of history um, and tradition that, you know, we happen to be a part of too. So that's probably my favorite. That's amazing. You're making me hungry. <laughs> How about you, Sandra? So I, I first was going to say my mom, but Lily stole that one from me. Um, because I, I couldn't say it any better than she did. My mom and her mom are probably kindred spirits. So I'm going to talk a little bit about my sister, um, my baby sister. So my sister is 20 years younger than me. Um, and uh, she, it was kind of, uh, my mom was like, she's her surprise. She was her surprise late in life package. Um, but my sister is... Um, a YouTube blogger, and I will put her stuff in the chat, but she is such a advocate. Um, and she does so much. She does, um, her blog is mostly about um, reading and, um, and young adult books and, and adult and, and, and YA and art. Why is young adult? I'm sorry, middle grade and adult books. And, um, she does a Korea, Koreathon, which is like Korean authors. She's had some um, multilingual or multicultural readathons. Um, she's sponsoring a trip to Korea next year. And I'm going to go back to Korea. I haven't been since I was nine months old. I'm so excited. And my mom hasn't been since I was nine months old. So she's kind of excited. So we're going to all go and, um, and see how much it's changed because I know it's trained, it's changed tremendously since my mom was there. My mom came when she was 20, you know, she's been here 50 years. Um, <laughs> and, um, and so, uh, you know, that is a huge thing, but she's amazing. And she shares so many resources with me, books that I've read, with Korean protagonists or other Asian protagonists and, and, and Asian authors. And, and so that's something that we do a lot. We will read these books. Um, and, and amazingly, some people are actually making these books into shows and movies. Um, like, uh, I don't know if you know, uh, the Pochenko, which is on, um, Apple TV, the book, I bawled when I read that book. I bawled when I read that book. And now it's a it's a show on 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 Apple TV and I've been watching it and I'm so excited. And of course like the man I love, the one Korean actor that I love is also in it so that doesn't hurt. Um but yeah, that's something that we do a lot of. We watch a lot of Korean dramas and we read a lot of Korean books and and then I, I wasn't even going to go to the food because, like I said, Lily covered that eloquently. So, um, but yeah. yeah. That's awesome. I um, just pinned uh, Pachinko so that I can, you know, make sure that I uh, um, dive into that as soon as possible. Thank you, Sandra. So, Elizabeth? Sandra, your sister is a badass um, and love all the recs that I got here today. Um, my favorite cultural tradition is the dance. Dance is so important in Lebanese culture. Um, I'm thinking of belly dance as well as dubke, which is a sort of line dance that we do in step holding hands with one another. It is just such a joyful experience whenever we're together as, as a Lebanese group um, or, you know, my other Southwest Asians in the house. So <laughs> we have a good time. Um, some of the people I'm really looking up to right now are uh, Andrew Ang, who is the creator of Coursera and a professor of computer science at, I believe, Stanford. Um, he taught me data science and without his, his incredible teaching that is just so accessible and inclusive, I would not be where I am right now. Um, and I know he's also starting a 
a company to bring more um, to bring a, a greater suite of curriculum to K through 12, including UX and UI and uh, data science and software engineering. So I'm excited to see where that goes. Um, but yeah, he's someone that I've been thinking about recently. That's amazing, Elizabeth. Thank you for sharing that. I love it. I think dance is also a very important part of, you know, across different cultures. And um, I love I love to dance too <laughs> as well. Um, I think we're going to um, wrap it up, but I really want to thank all of you, you know, for um, participating. And I, there was tons of other questions that we wanted to ask, but we are out of time to do that. So I just want to say thank you before um, Lily is going to come on and um, close us out. Thank you, Lynn. Uh, thank you, Lynn, and to Lily and Sandra and Elizabeth. This was such a rich discussion um, that I will definitely have to sit through uh, and even watch the recording because I know I didn't get any capture at all. Um, but thank you so much for taking the time to speak to our community. Um, I wanted to uh, call out some of the resources that we wanted folks to have um, as they are preparing to um, celebrate AAPI Heritage Month in the month of May. Um, so if, if you want to grab the slides, y'all, there is the slide deck and you'll find a handful of resources there that are there. There's some gen generic, um, some generic resources regarding the Heritage Month that you can definitely take, go, go take a look at. There's videos, exhibits, there's a section just for teachers, and there's a lot of images if you want to grab those and utilize that. Um, and then also, um, uh, San Francisco Unified School Dish, uh, csnsf.org has curated a ton of Heritage Month resources that it, uh, that is a really good place to go for a lot of different um, Heritage Months. So check that out. Um, and then also provided by Elizabeth, she uh, gave us something that the Smithsonian Institution did was an um, disaggregating data about Asian American and, a and Pacific Islander communities a really awesome uh, resource that you might want to consider. Take, um, and so also we wanted to make sure that those of you who are here, uh, we would love to get your feedback about this event. Um, take this survey uh, so we can make sure that all the future events uh, will continue to improve. And also you'll receive a certificate of completion um, right when you submit. Uh, so we thank you in advance for doing that some upcoming events for CSDA. If you're new to our organization, come check out what, what that means and all the research, uh, all the benefits to being a member um, on the 4th of May. And on the 11th you'll see uh, of May, we have another PLS that's geared towards the celebration of Pride History Month. It's titled Outstanding Voices. It's an LGBTQ plus panel and Pride History Month resources. Um, that would be a one to mark on your calendar. Uh, we are previewing our the CSDA Summer Conference at the Engage event on June 6th, and we are going to wrap up the season of professional learning series with our uh, code in play. And that's when you'll there'll be a handful of platforms that you can learn more about and collaborate and develop projects with others. It's really just to play. Um, so there's no strings attached except come learn something and hang out with other teachers who want to do the same. So thank you so much for joining us to our panel and our moderator. This was such an amazing night. We hope you all uh, are beginning to find ways to to uh, to celebrate um, AAPA Heritage Month, not just in your classrooms, but in all the spaces that you're a part of, um, and that you that we're going to continue to be in this practice of celebrating the community. The, the contributions of so many different communities that make up um, the society that we're living in. So thank you, everyone. Have a great morning, day, evening, whatever, wherever you are. Um, we hope to see you at the next event.